This is the third interview with graduate students in the department. I'm speaking to one of my close friends in the department. His name is Brandon Morton. He is doing his PhD in pure mathematics like me, except he has chosen the algebra route, whereas I took the analysis route. So I wanted to ask him a few questions about what it is like taking the algebra courses and basically his overall roadmap to success here, because he's been here longer than me. In fact, uh, when we first met, uh, you spoke to one of the course coordinators about being, we have like a mentorship type thing right. here, right? right? Right, So what exactly is that? Because I've never been a mentor to any of the new people coming in, but you were like assigned, I was given to you so that if I had any like specific nitty gritty questions, then I would come to you, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. how it works? How does it work? Uh, yeah, so they, they do something where the, the new graduate students who come in uh, haven't taught before. Yeah. Whereas, and you're expected to teach right away, and not just assist in a class, but actually teach a class. So, uh, a lot of the new graduate students get kind of nervous in doing it, or they have technology questions, or student questions, or you know, things always pop up that you never imagine. So, yeah. um, the course coordinator for our like college algebra class ends up taking graduate students who have been there for a couple of years and have taught. Uh, and assign it and letting them be mentors. So you end up getting some part of your uh, your yearly credit. You know, we have to do 10 credit hours a, a year. So part of that mm -hmm. is included in there. And then we help help the new graduate students with whatever questions they have with respect to teaching, whether it's technology or student you know, dealing with student stuff or um, really just whatever, whatever questions could come to mind. Some students take more work than others. Um, where you know some may have questions almost every day, others okay. are kind of uh, you know you let them you let them go and they're perfectly fine, <laughs> I, and that's them. that's kind of how you were you know you were just, okay. you were fine. So, but that's really what the mentor. I remember that day because I thought you were a student of mine because I didn't know who you were. <laughs> you were sitting in the back and then you came yeah. up to talk and I was like, yes, can I help you? He goes, hey, I'm Brandon, I'm your mentor. I was like, oh shoot, I got an email about you. <laughs> so, yeah. so I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. so. Uh, I think you sat in maybe one day or two days yeah. and then you went Something back like to the course. I remember that semester being rough for me mm. because it was my very first semester and I had never, well, I had taught before a class before, but this was pre-COVID Right. because when I, when I did my master's degree, my master's degree was messed up because it was two years at, at a different university. It was yeah. two years. The first year, there was, um, there was unrest within the faculty. Okay. Like, I don't know. I've never really mentioned this on the channel before, but yeah. there was an unrest in the faculty because they didn't like the way the administration was doing things. And then they wanted to have a discussion about the contracts that they signed. Mm -hmm. Like, it was specifically about healthcare, was the thing that there were many things, but it was about the, it was specifically, it was about the healthcare plan. Mm -hmm. And there was a back and forth, and then eventually they start, started to throw around the word strike. Like, the faculty was threatening to go on strike. I see. And then everyone and all the students were asking questions to their teachers, like, is it serious? Are they going to go on strike? And in the beginning, they were like, no, don't worry about it. That's just rumors. Don't worry about that. And then as the months went along, this is the first year in my master's program, it became more and more evident that a strike <laughs> was going to come. Yeah. And then I think it was either January 2019 or uh, February 2019. I don't remember the month. But the faculty ended up going on strike. Oh, really? And they went on strike for three weeks. It was not a short period of time. Okay. And that was a big deal because the graduate students, the GTA, so I was a GTA there as well. I taught. Yeah. We all had to be huddled into a room with the department chair, and she was like, okay, what are we going to do? <laughs> like she goes, he goes, no, I don't have anyone teaching anything now. <laughs> so they're like, okay, grad students, so... I'm not going to, so she, she tried to really assure us that nothing bad was going to happen to us. Right. But uh, I remember the grad student courses that I took were not being covered. Oh, wow. And they this just is... told us, like, before they went on strike, I think they even said, okay, if I don't know how long I'm not going to be here, but here's a book. Read this in the book. <laughs> so we were kind of responsible for our own education there for that for last, for that, for a few weeks. Right. And eventually the faculty came back. And I'm not really sure what happened in the wake of it, but I remember it was kind of a taboo topic that no one wanted to ask any questions about. Mm -hmm. That was the first year of my graduate program <laughs> as a master's student. The second year, 
there was a COVID <laughs> right. that shut, and then and then like it was almost like one year to the day. Right. We had the grad students had to be huddled in with the chair of the department, and you're like, okay, what are we gonna do? Right. right. <laughs> the same exact conversation, except now everything had to be remote. Right. So I got my money's worth with how much experience I got for those two years of teaching and making sure that the class got put online right. and all that stuff. I want to talk more about it, but well, I feel that it's. <laughs> I'm gonna spend more time with you. An interesting COVID thing. So. When COVID back in March 2020, I was giving I gave a talk in the algebra seminar. Yeah, and I was supposed to have I was teaching a class like 15 20 minutes after that, mm -hmm. and I was getting emails from my students saying, "Do we have class today? Do we have class today?" I had like eight or nine uh, emails, and I'm looking at it like, of, "Of course we have class today. What are you What are you talking about?" Yeah. Um, so I'm reading the, I just finished my, my talk, I'm reading these emails, and then we get that university-wide e email saying, you know, classes are canceled for the rest of the week. This was on Tuesday, so they can't cancel class for the rest of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it was Wednesday when they emailed us back and said, classes are just canceled indefinitely. It, well, classes are moving online. Yeah. So from the time, like I gave a talk in the algebra seminar, and... Yeah the uh between that and classes being fully remote we only had a few days and it was i remember talking to the course coordinator and she was just like we just we just got to figure this out there's there's no way around it but the university was saying like well we can't congregate in rooms and this that that sort of thing it was it was a mess for, <laughs> for a few days it was i still can't believe that we actually transitioned as from a student's perspective, uh, and not my student's perspective, it seemed seamless to them. Yeah. It was not seamless. It was probably, you remember that, you know that meme with Spongebob where he's inside his brain and they're throwing papers all around. They're yeah. like, we threw out his name. Yeah. That's exactly how it was, I it was that it went down. <laughs> it, chaos is an understatement, but yeah, anyway. Okay. So I bring it up, I bring that up specifically because I had a lot of experience teaching a class under weird circumstances, whether it was a faculty strike or online removing that. So, and then, you know, after that was done, I got an adjunct position mm -hmm. teaching remotely at a community college. Okay. I did that for a year while I was trying to find PhD programs. Okay. So I was, you know, comfortable teaching, but I hadn't been up in front of people for over a year right. by the time I came in here because that's when we first started doing face-to-face -face lectures again right so that was so that was the first semester we were doing that and then I got there and I was just like I, it's like I forgot how to do it right I mean that one day you saw me I was probably you know hot or something but I remember the course coordinator came in and watched me one day and I was not hot it did not go well <laughs> it really didn't go well yeah, yeah and then at the end she came up to me and she goes uh we should talk I was like oh that hurts yeah that hurts and I remember there was a tornado I don't think there was a tornado watch or warning it was like be on the lookout for a tornado. Right. So they're like, stay indoors. When she watched me that one day, it was in the afternoon. And so I was kind of trapped in a room with her. And she goes, okay, since we have some time. I was like, no, oh, yeah. not now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we talked and I made some corrections. So it's important to, you know, remember that you're not bulletproof. But that's, a, that's the thing with new grad students. It, it, from the, the first time that you teach to the last time that you teach, you are going to have hiccups in the beginning because you've never taught before. So it's just, as soon as you get some criticism, you just make the corrections and move forward. Yeah. Um, it's when I first when I learned that I was going to just be hoisted in front of a room and just teach this class. Um, it was quite. Uh, I, I was I was nervous because I at, at that point I had never taught before, whereas you did, um, and most of the graduate students haven't. Um, and it was nerve-wracking. Nerve um, but you just, like what you did, you just make the corrections that, that you're asked for, and then that's the end of it. And, you know, you're certainly not a bad instructor by any means. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the new graduate students who come in I, are probably more nervous than what they lead on about teaching for the first time. Uh, and my only advice would just be not to be. Just don't be nervous. Just like, don't be nervous. Well, you're going to be, or maybe a better a better thing is is expect to be nervous, but realize it's okay. Eventually, it goes away. Like right. the more you do it, I think that's true for anything. Whether you're practicing an instrument, if you want to play, right. or perform, I think it, the public speaking thing is probably the most is the scariest thing about it. 
there's a there's a I think there's a Jerry Seinfeld bit where he says the number one fear in the world is public speaking and the number two is dying. <laughs> like you'd rather <laughs> public you would rather die than give a give a yeah, speech before yeah. a public. So yeah. and I don't really remember myself being super nervous the very first time. I don't remember is what I'm saying. I may right. have been like a nerve wreck. But uh, eventually it becomes so you get used so used to it. Mm-hmm. And the amount of responsibility as a graduate student that you get, like when they tell you you need to you need to do this, you need to make sure your homework's done, you need to give a presentation at the seminar, you have to do a bunch of things. Right. You don't really have time to think about being nervous anymore. Right. At least that's how I see it now. I just I just hope I don't absolutely make a fool out of myself sometimes. Like I get my words all twisted up, but that just comes with time. I think. Right, and you're you're not going to do everything perfectly. You're just yeah, trying, that's... you're you're just trying to do the best that you can, and you get better as time goes on. Yeah. So as a new graduate student, it's like oh, you have you have all of these tasks and responsibilities, and you just have to realize that now it's not an excuse not to do well. It's just a reason why uh, you have to to remember that you will get better in these things. So. You do the best that you can and realize that you're going to get better over time. And as long as you do that, you'll be perfectly fine. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm a better instructor now than I was when I first started. So when did you first start? What was the very first semester? I can't remember if it was fall of 2017 or if I waited. It may have been spring 2018. But I came in part, so I didn't come in under... You came in part time. Right, I came in part time. So the university paid for four credit hours of mine per semester. So when I came in, I only took four credit hours each semester. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so whereas like most peer students come in and you take your first semester, you take um, abstract algebra one as well as uh, real analysis one. Yeah, they take I, them both. Right, I didn't do that. I took abstract algebra one and then I waited for the following year to take real analysis one. Okay, so, so you did like al- just algebra the first year, and then the second year you did analysis. Yeah, just algebra the first year. The going into my second semester, I believe I did complex analysis then. Okay. Um, because it, so I was kind of forced to take two classes. Oh, I there. see. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then the the next year, then I did real analysis one and real analysis two. So it took me two full years to take the qualifier courses. Okay, so two years in, you have those classes under your belt, right. and then you take qualifier, the very first one? The very first time, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Which how, how did it go the very first did time? Not, not only did it not go well the first time, it didn't go well the second and third time. The second and third time. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I struggled. I struggled quite a bit with the qualifying. I didn't struggle with the algebra qualifying exam. No one really seems to struggle with it. If you put in an honest effort, I, I mentioned it before. Right, yeah. right. Um, because, you, know, you know, fairness is a word that's thrown around a lot, but every every school, every department, these exams are different. So, yeah. you know, with where, with where we go, the analysis qualifying exam is definitely more, um, is definitely more difficult to prepare for than the algebra qualifying exam. I would say it's just hard to prepare for. I wouldn't right. really call it unfair, the right. test. Yep. It's just, it's just, what are you expected to know when you go into it? Right. There's a lot of uncertainty. Right. And I'm not, like, the, the abstract algebra exam, it's not like we cut off uh, certain topics. All the topics are included. It, it's just what you would expect. So it's, it, you can prepare for it like that. The analysis qualifier, I just, I really struggled with. And uh, it was very difficult for me to build intuition and analysis to solve problems. I felt like I under let I start and maybe after the the first qualifier, the first qualifier, I just had laps of knowledge. Yeah. Um after once I took and maybe even the second qual- time I took that qualifier. Did you take them like a semester apart or a year apart? I took I took two the first two times that I took it, I took it a semester apart. And then I remember there was a January qualifier that I skipped because I thought I just needed more time to prepare and I wanted to give myself yeah. that whole year until August. And then um, the graduate coordinator emailed me. He's like, oh, you know, you didn't take this, but I at least want you to see it. And okay. when he emailed it to me, I really kicked myself because I, as soon as I looked at it, I knew how to do seven of the problems on there. 
Oh. So. That must not feel good. <laughs> it didn't feel good, especially when I failed it in August. Yeah. And I knew that I would have passed it in January. Yeah, that's um, that's rough. So it it de- it was a it was a real struggle for me, and uh, you know. Did you prepare? solo like alone or did you have like a group of people that you studied with when i first started the when i first started in in the qualifiers um i think it may have been the group that was before you or maybe a couple of years before you okay um so at that time there was a little bit of preparation together um uh, but right. not a ton some of the main concepts like we learned like i remember going and uh, we spent a day learning what like a Laurent series was and yeah. things like that. Um, and then most of it was together. As I continued on, there were some students that didn't feel like they could get past the qualifier, so they left. Mm-hmm. And then there were other students who ended up getting past it and then continued on. Yeah. Um, so and I was kind of, I was really kind of stuck in limbo because I didn't, I didn't pass, so I couldn't continue on with the rest. But I just didn't want to, I didn't want to like accept that failure. Yeah. So as the department continued to give me opportunities. But you, I, com- you improved every single time. I did, yeah. Yeah, so every so, single time they, t- he's like, okay, this guy will eventually do it. Yeah, so, so they. So that was part of the reason why they, they, they let you take it. They kept, now I'm not saying that my knowledge improved, maybe it did, but, but um, my, at least my score on the, qual- you know, they're all different. You can, the, yeah. the previous one doesn't really prepare you for the next one. Um, so my score was improving. The graduate coordinator saw enough improvement that he let me keep taking an opportunity. Um, and eventually, uh, I did pass. And, and not only did I, not only did I pass, I passed with a high score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in an they were, they were like, shit. <laughs> it's like, he really improved. Right, right, like, right You right. got a really banging score that last time. Right. So I, you know, it was, uh. I always wanted to try my luck going to some of the professors and being like, hey, I guess I scored high <laughs> enough to work with you. He was like, yeah, but how many times you take it? And they were like, yeah, oh, yeah. let's not talk about that. Yeah. So <laughs> it was, and it was weird because I, I, for two years of my life, I went to campus and I studied every single day. How many hours a day did you dedicate? At least six. At yeah. least. And I mean, this is every day. That, my birthday, Christmas, <laughs> holidays, I was on campus studying. That's me all of last year. Yeah, every <laughs> single day. And when I got the email uh, from the graduate coordinator saying that I passed at the PhD level, I remember I just put my phone down and it was just, to, to say like a burden off my shoulders is an understatement. Like I, I didn't know what to do after that because <laughs> I, I didn't know anything else besides studying that, that many hours. I had the same feeling. I was like, what do now? Right. For analysis... <laughs> Knowing that after that, the amount of analysis that I was going to use essentially goes goes away. It comes up every now and then, but whenever it does come up, it's always like, oh, look, by the way, yeah, this complex analysis or this real analysis thing is here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like you need intuition in it to... Uh, to when, when you were studying, did you ever have like... Like if it's in the afternoon, you've just been studying all morning and you're like, okay, I got to look away from this for a minute. And then you just lie down on the bed and then just, but then like you kind of enter into this, not, you're not sleeping fully. You're like half asleep. Right. And then in your, but your brains just keep going. It's, it's reviewing <laughs> contour integrals and control maps. I could not study at home. So I would go to campus to study. Yeah. Um, and every few, like every two hours I had an alarm on my phone where I would leave the math building. I would walk up to the library and around and back to the math building. And then, so that was every two hours. And then every other one of those walks, I would take and I would take an extra 10 minutes and go a little bit further. Yeah. Um, and I had to just not to drive myself insane. But when I would come home, and I would have to, I would have to be careful because when I would come home, my, my mind would race and it would, st- like what you were saying, it would start thinking about, you know, different topics and stuff. But I, I would have to try to shut that off because I didn't feel like my intuition was strong enough to let those thoughts race. <laughs> because I thought that it would... Take you down a dark path that it, was just like, he's the, like, this is nonsense. Exactly. I need to get back to what's exactly. true. Exactly, yeah. 
so like as I do research in my stuff it's like I love when that happens because it, like you know I can I can be doing something and I can start thinking of my stuff and I can just kind of like let my mind wander and I can start if I have a thought I can piece together either logic that confirms it yeah. or logic that uh, disproves it uh, sometimes sometimes I, I can but anyway but with analysis I could never really make those connections one way or the other so I tried not to uh, let my mind go there. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, to say I struggled is an understatement. <laughs> it and, puts hair on your chest. Yeah, I think. it's, and you know, this whole time I'm watching other graduate students leave. Yeah, that's the rough part too. Yeah. Then you just feel like, well, what about me guys? Don't forget about me. I, it was definitely, you know, the first couple of times I failed that exam, I, I was embarrassed because I didn't feel like I was good enough. Yeah. And then I got to the point to where I was embarrassed because the department kept giving me opportunities and I was just, I was like, oh, oh okay, sure, I'll, I'll do it. And I just, it was, it was almost an embarrassment of like, I felt like they were just taking pity. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a struggle. I would say either the, the fourth or fifth time it was, um, you I ended up passing on fifth, right? Uh, yes. I, I, honestly, I can't remember if it's the fourth or the fifth. I want to say that it's the fifth, but I can't remember one of the exams in between. So mm -hmm. it was either way. It was one of those. And whether it's the fourth or the fifth, it's the most that anybody in the department has taken. You set the record, buddy. I set the record regardless <laughs> of which number it is. Now, maybe, you know. But you were still part-time when you passed it, right? Or uh, Yeah, you, I or was part-time. So when you passed it, did they come to you and say, okay, you can become full-time student now? Yeah, well, the graduate court, so I passed it, and I, um, I started working with my advisor immediately. So the, a couple of months before I passed it, I met with the guy who's my advisor now um, and really kind of told him the situation that I was in. Yeah. Um, and most, it, was, it was kind of a mixture of complaining about the situation because my, you know, my score at that point had gotten to the point to where they mm -hmm. could have allowed me to pass. Well, um, and me kind of telling him like, you know, I really start, want to start working together, but I can't, I can't do anything until I just pass this analysis. Thing. So like, I can't even start working right now because I still have all this analysis that I have to go through in my mind. Um, so I, uh, um, so I was, I was still part-time when this happened. I passed, I was up in my office one day and then the graduate coordinator uh, emailed me and said, um, hey, if you want one of the positions for full-time for the graduate assistantship, yeah. I was like, I'd, I'd be really happy to extend it to you. Okay. Um, and I, his office was right by mine, and I walked over to his office and I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> why, why would you do that? And uh, his reason was because I, I showed the perseverance in an improvement that I showed was worthy. They knew you were a hard worker. Essentially. Uh, now, you know, I still kind of doubted myself whether or not I deserved it. Um, but it was, I, I felt, it really made all that embarrassment that I felt for so long kind of go away. Mm -hmm. Because I was, I was always embarrassed that I failed. How do you deal with the embarrassment? Like, not, not the embarrassment, but the failure in general. Because... I mentioned my experience on the channel before, failing the first time, passing yeah. the second time. Yeah. And that's a, I think it's, I think a lot of students go through that. Right. That where they try really hard and they fail, but their tests are not like these tests. These yeah. tests require at least a year in preparation right. of I, like real serious work. And then when you, if you fail that, that's a different level of... <laughs> Right, self pity and self. What's right. the word I'm looking for? Is <laughs> just, mm. just absolute well, devastation. I think right, and I think the word failure is used in both both instances. I tell my students that there's a difference. You you have failure where you, you know, a lot of times students say I tried as hard as I could, but they really didn't. No, they didn't. No, they, they don't. Didn't they try did, they as think hard they, as they do. They could. Right, and they want to think that they do. Because when they think that they do, then they put the blame on somebody else. I think I tried as hard as I could, but, you know, maybe the test was unfair. Maybe these were questions that we didn't cover in class, blah, blah, blah. You, you've heard all the excuses from your students. My, 
my thing is is the failure that I had was me actually putting forth the absolute best effort that I could. And, you know, I fancy myself as not a moron. And There's no one in the PhD department right. that's a moron. And when you try as hard as you can at something, and you're told that it just isn't good enough, and it doesn't happen once or twice or three times... <laughs> But it keep, it just keeps yeah. going, and that yeah. is that is a really hard that that will prompt an existential crisis. Yeah, and it's just one of those things where you have to, at least in my and for me, I either had to accept and and accept that I wasn't good enough. Um, you or, you start asking yourself some hard questions yes. that you and need you, an answer to. You start to sit sit alone in a dark room on your bed and have conversations with yourself that you don't want to have. Um, and you can either accept that you're not good enough or you can tr- continue to try as hard as you can and realize that the limit that you thought you reached was not the limit. And you can push a little bit further and get to that point. Do um, you, not to interrupt no. so much, but... Uh, when you were in school, were you good at mathematics? Like, how, how what was your math um, skills like when you were in high school, for example? Let's just horrible. Go. Horrible. Horrible. I almost flunked. So, I don't know if we've ever talked about this. Um, when I, so my senior year of high school, I slept. I slept where I didn't go. My girlfriend and I moved out, the girl I was with at the time, we moved out to an apartment. In high school? In high school, yeah. Because she was a year older, so she started college. Um, so this is like senior year. This is my senior year. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I went to high school my last year, not a lot, a handful of times. Yeah. And I ended up, I ended up going in one day and my parents were there with the administration and it was, I should not have passed high school, but I did. Okay. I went to college right after I, I didn't, I went to college right after and I was a, I was a nursing major and I nursing, nursing. Yeah. Cause my girlfriend was a nursing major. So it's all I knew. Okay. And I had to take pre-cal. Yeah. And I was on the track of failing pre-calc. And I'm like, I can't get past this. I can't pass pre-calc. <laughs> and I ended up switching my major to marketing. Okay. Where I just had to take statistics. Yeah. But I was failing all my other classes. I think my GPA when I left that school was a 1.03. It's not so, the best? Not but, the best. Okay. So I dropped out okay. before I flunked out. Was this at a university or a community college? A yeah, university. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I I dropped out and I went to work for two and a half, three years. Full time work, seven dollars or eight dollars and fifty cents an hour. Um, I worked from five AM to one PM. And I worked with a bunch of like fifty and sixty year olds who were making that amount who were miserable to put it in the, the nicest the terms. nicest term. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to be that. I need to go get some education. Okay. So I went to a community college and majored in electrical engineering technology. And I had to take a class called Concepts of Calculus, which is essentially Calc 1 without the trig. Um, Some schools teach it as like business calculus or intuitive Intuitive calculus. calculus. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a professor who I really liked, and I, I did well in the class. I, now, I took pre-calc before this, and I told myself I was going to pass, and I passed uh, with an A in the class. I took concepts of calculus, and I really liked it. I really liked the professor. And I was taking my electrical classes, and there were, like, formulas. And I remember I had one guy for a bunch of my classes, a really, a really great, great professor, and I asked him, I'm like, where does all this come from? And he said, it's in the math. He's like, if you want to know about it, take calculus. And the school that I was at, had a the guy who taught calculus one two and three was the same guy and he had horrible reviews and i never heard anything nice about him and i took calc one with him and i remember i went after the first couple of days we just started like learning about limits i went to his office and i remember asking how do i get good at this and i don't mean like how do i pass the class but how do i actually get good at this and he said solve the book 
and he was not kidding. He's like, solve the book. If you solve the book, you'll be solve you'll, the book as solve, in like solve the calculus book. Like it states theorem, then you prove theorem. No, 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 or no, no. Just do just the, the exercise. Oh, okay. You know, calculate these limits. He's like, he's like, you're you're bad at algebra and trig. He's like, you you got an A in algebra and trig, but you're bad at algebra and trig. So you need to get good at algebra and trig. Yeah. Here before I don't want to derail yeah. you, but you said something that's interesting because. I was thinking about this the other day when I was thinking about all the high school classes I took. Yeah. Like, I'm not good at, like, English. Right. Or any of those liberal arts type colleges, or not right. colleges, but those classes. And I remember I got A's in high school, but I still didn't understand anything right. about that stuff. So I think it's like, why am I getting, why do I get A's and other people get, like, C's and D's and F's or whatever? Right. And I think the only difference between an A student and a C student is just how much effort you put in there. Because right. they have like the same level of understanding. Right. It's just what gets you to that A is the effort that you put in high right. school. Because in high school, I hate to say it, but they don't. the bar's not very high. Right. When you get out into the real world 10 years later and you look back and you're like, okay, it really wasn't that bad. Right. It looks bad at that moment. But right. It's only, it only looks that bad because you're, you know, you haven't seen how bad it can get. Right. <laughs> I, I, I would say, and anybody who's listening to this, I would say if you're in a math class and you want to ask yourself, do I understand what I'm learning? You should ask yourself, can I teach this? Yeah. Because if you feel like you can teach this, not when you walk into a room, do you already know what's going to be said? But I mean, if you took time on yourself to learn it, could you go and have a lecture on it? And yeah. if you can teach the topic, then you understand the topic. If you can't teach the topic, then you have some gaps in your understanding. But so, so, so the reason that you got into mathematics was because of those formulas and just the curiosity well, I ended, that you had with it? With so I, I took the calculus classes um, at the community college, but I, I absolutely loved this professor. He, he, held, he held his students to a standard that most students just didn't reach. And that's what led to a lot of the negative reviews. But I realized all he was trying to do was to make his students actually understand the math. And yeah. his, his approach is like, you know, sure, we're at a community college, but this is Calculus 1. No matter where you go, this is Calculus 1. Whether you take it at a community college or some prestigious university, the topics in Calculus 1 is the topic, are the topics in Calculus 1. So why not understand them as you would no matter where you are? And I would go to office hours, and he would just, he seemed like the first person who cared enough about my education that he was willing to fail me, if that sounds strange. Like, because he was going to hold me to a standard, and, and if I didn't meet that standard, then I was going to suffer the consequences of it. Right. He wasn't just going to push me along because he liked me, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I took Calc 1, 2, and 3 with him. Uh, by the time we got to uh, Calc 3, Green's Theorem, Stokes' Theorem, I saw where all those formulas came from. Yeah. And I remember asking him one day at one of the other local universities around here, I said, hey, there's all these math classes that isn't offered at the community college. What are they? And he said, go find out. <laughs> I think he just kind of threw you to the lions in a he, way. <laughs> I, I absolutely love this guy. I still talk to him now. Um, I have the absolute utmost respect for him. Yeah. And would you say he was your favorite instructor of all time? Uh, or do you not want to say? He he's de he's definitely up there. Top three. So, oh yeah, definitely okay. top three. Oh yeah, yeah 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 yeah. You know it's hard it's hard for me to put somebody past a couple of the folks that I've had in graduate school just because of you know like when I look at my advisor the amount of time and effort that he's uh, given me it's you know that's. Uh, it's it you can't put into words how much you appreciate that yeah um but this guy he really pushed me he and he pushed me in a way that made me realize that there's a there's a standard that i should live up to so i was i was never a great math student i i was curious about what was next and i didn't i didn't want to just stop because it got hard and now on a personal side, you know, the girl that I was with at that time wasn't very supportive and she was, she wanted me just to stop and go work and she would say, you know, you, you can't do this, you're not capable. So that was a driving factor. You're like, I'll prove you wrong. Exactly. Yeah. And there, when I would fail the qualifiers, that was the first thing that I would think of. 
when I would read the emails from the graduate coordinator, <laughs> that was the first thing that I would think of. And think of her saying, see, told you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> honestly, yep. Yeah, that and, must have stung a little different. Yeah, and uh, when, uh, and you know, I went, I did, I, I went to a local university and I did my undergrad, but by that time I knew that I wanted to do math. I liked, I liked, it, it like, it made, it made sense in my brain. Yeah. And I like, you know, I never had a good memory. So the, the idea of taking classes and having to like memorize things for an exam just didn't sit well with me. And I liked the idea of, okay, you're telling me something and now you're going to prove it to me. Yeah. And you're going to show me exactly why. And now you just want me to be able to prove things to you. So it, uh, it made sense in my brain. Yes, I think a lot of people that go toward and go into math have that same feeling too because I think that's part of the reason why I liked math so much was that um, it wasn't just memorization of just basic facts. Now, I like stuff like that in general. Like, mm -hmm. This is probably a lesser known detail, but I really love history. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is for the same reason you have. I had a good history instructor. Like, in, in, it was a high school instructor. It was my freshman year of high school. I took a history class. And the guy was probably at least through K-12, was probably the best teacher I ever had. Yeah. After that, in college, I have to think about it a little bit more, but he's still up there. Right. Like, he was able to, he didn't really, like, his lectures didn't even feel like lectures. It was like he was a storyteller, and he was good at it. Right. Like, he was really good at what he did. Right. And because of that, it's like, I had a greater, I've already been kind of interested in history, like, recent history, like, past 100 years. But with him, it's like I looked at the whole thing. Right. And for one day, I was a history major in college. For one day. <laughs> I was one day history major, and I switched majors. I don't remember why. I think I just didn't like the one class I sat in on, which I wouldn't really recommend doing that, like switching yeah. majors, because <laughs> yeah. of one bad yeah. class. It wasn't even bad. It wasn't bad. It's just I didn't feel like, like you said, it's like I don't belong here. Right. Yeah. Like this isn't my calling, right. which is what you kind of have to do when you're in college because you're trying to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Because right. if you're going to go work for eight bucks an hour with those 50, 60 year old guys, right, and they are miserable, you have that's when you have to ask yourself really hard questions. Like I don't really want to be here, right, doing this. Yep. So, if you can find something that you you absolutely are passionate about or that you just feel comfortable with, yeah, then I think that's a good decision to stay with math. So let me ask you this, because you you said to yourself that uh, you weren't really a gifted math student in right. high school were you gifted in any subject was there one subject that you were really good at were you good at sports or anything I played sports I what, played sports what did I you play I played football baseball um, basketball and I golfed now once I started getting into golf um, I ended up stopping football and stuff and I golfed yeah um, but eventually you know, I, was, I was with the same girl that I moved out with my senior year and, uh, I know it's Valentine's Day, so be, have some respect for the single people in the room. <laughs> because <laughs> hey, well, it's not like we're together anymore. Okay, anyway. all right. Um, but uh, I ended up kind of putting everything on hold because our our relationship kind of took me away from from where I was in high school. I was very immature, and I made a lot of choices that I shouldn't have made. Okay. Um, but I did golf. But I was never. I, I would say that um, I was always capable. But I never wanted to put in the effort. Yeah. And it's not something that just like even even math. Matt, I am not naturally gifted at math. Now, now maybe maybe when I say that I'm saying I'm not naturally gifted at math in comparison to mathematicians that I know. Maybe. But what about compared to other people in the room? I would uh, then probably yeah. You know I'm probably able to con make connections more than some other people. Yeah. Um, but when I look at like my advisor, for instance, the way that his mind works and how quickly he's able to make connections is quicker than the way that I'm able to make connections. Now, maybe that's from 30 years experience, but he's, he's a more mentally gifted mathematician than I am. I eat something that I think about because these guys that you know teach our classes, they've probably been doing this for at least 30 years longer mm -hmm. than than me and you, maybe 20 years, we're not that young, <laughs> 20 to 30 years. So when I see them, it's like, okay, are they just, it, you have to ask the question is like, is it potential? Is it just practice that gets you there? Or are they just, they're just awesome in that regard. <laughs> it sounds to me like you're just, 
your whole deal was just practice that you just you were just you just kept with it you never got discouraged even though the world was telling you to go do something else you're I, just like no i'm dying on this hill I, I will get to the end i i i definitely i would say that i definitely got discouraged but i my my will to not accept failure was greater than my will to not want to be discouraged okay so i was more accepting of being upset about failing or not living up to somebody else's expectations, blah, blah, blah. Then I was, I just didn't want to think of myself as a failure. Yeah. And if I, and if I did fail, I wanted the department to tell me like, you're, you're actually not good enough. We're not giving you any more tra- chances. Have a good day. Bye. As long as they were willing to give opportunities, I almost felt like I, I have to take this opportunity because I, I felt that I was capable of going to the next step. It sounds like an athlete's mentality in a way. I mean, you took sports. Yeah, mm-hmm. I hear a lot of. I didn't. I didn't do sports in high school. Right. I kind of wish I did, but whatever. But now it just seems to me that a lot of those, you know, high school athletes have they develop that self confidence. Right. That comes with not wanting to accept defeat. Right. That maybe that helped you when you were going through the falls. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I I didn't want to quit. If somebody told me that I couldn't. The, 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 and now when I say somebody should, tells me that I couldn't, I mean them saying, we're not going to let you take this again. Yeah. Uh, I would rather that happen than me say, I'm not going to take it again. I quit. Yeah. Um, so I, that was always my thing. Now, there were times when the department would tell me, you know, you can, we're going to give you another opportunity where I was thinking to myself, like, Really? You really, <laughs> you're really gonna make me go through this again? Um, but looking back on it, I would, I'd do it ten times over again because okay. I, I'm glad where I've got. And uh, you know, as I do research now and as we make progress and get results, it uh, it makes me realize, like, okay, this is this is what I worked for, you know, and this is where yeah. I always I always said like this is what I was capable of, and now. You know, I'm starting to, to show it more, more and more in a in a very uh, elementary sense. Yeah. You know, and at least I'm I'm making progress. Okay. So I'm now I'm not saying that I'm making progress faster than other people, or I'm not saying that I'm making. Yeah, more. I don't think comparing yourself to someone else and where you know how fast they can get to point, from point A to point B is a. I don't know, but I don't think dangerous game to play is the right phrase, but it's it's a pointless game. We'll put right. it that way. It's like why would you do that? Right. It doesn't matter how fast you get there, you definitely just get there. Right. Just you know, you're you're only competing with your you're only competing with yourself until you graduate. Yeah, I, I mentioned that a long time ago. Yeah. So uh, and it is very true. Everyone everyone knows that and when every, they get here. And everybody stumbles. Everybody struggles with certain things. You know, I struggle with the qualifying exams. Some people struggle with the research. Yeah. Like you, you said, the guy that you talked to, he was stuck for two years. <laughs> yeah. On on research. And then um, eventually, in that very at the very end, he was he was starting to make some progress. Right. So it's kind of it's hard to do research when you don't clearly see where the end game is, like where the goalpost right. is. Right. That's that's the most discouraging part. And that's and I probably lucked into it. You know, the the problem that I'm working on. Okay, um, I do want to talk about some of the topics. Oh courses yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, let's start with the topics course, and we'll go. We'll get into research, and we'll probably wrap up there because it's almost forty five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so tell me about. I haven't taken any right. of the algebra special topics courses because I took the analysis stuff and the probability theory. So, what are some of the algebra special topics courses? The, that we the offer? special topics courses, uh, they do a class in a finite group theory, uh, character theory of finite groups, um, and then there's a structures of rings and algebras class, uh, two two classes of that. Um, do they do anything with fields? Field not theory? not particularly. Um, probably just because there isn't a field theorist uh, on on staff. I will say. In talking to my advisor this past week, the even though there's not a field theorist on staff, the love that they have for Galois theory, just because it sparked group theory, uh, is there. So, it, 
I've, I think I've only ever met one field theorist, somebody who would actually characterize them as a field theorist. But a lot of people, it's, at least to me, who like field theory, really like Galois theory, and then Galois theory leads them to group theory. Mm-hmm. Um, and then where they go from group theory is kind of up to them. Um, of those uh, algebra topics, there's the way that books usually teach them, like graduate level algebra books, it's like it starts with group theory and then they add more rules to the game. <laughs> yeah. So when you add more rules to group theory, you get ring theory. And when yeah. you add more rules to ring theory, you get field theory. And like the the sub field subfield's not the best word, but like within field theory there's Galois theory. It's almost like an like a branch of it. Well is that correct? Well, that's how it's taught. That's how it's but taught. But that's not how it is in practice. Well, you know, field theory uh, well, field theory leads to Galois theory. Galois theory is really what sparks group theory. Okay. So it's almost done in a, in a backwards direction. When you're learning it, it's easier to learn groups because you only have one operation. Well, yeah. And then rings, now you have two operations. And then you can learn about field theory after that. Um, so that's usually the way that it's taught. How it, how it came about, it's not in that order yeah but learning it that's definitely uh, probably the best way of learning it um it, you know group theory ends up branching out at least in my experience a, a lot into well group group theory and ring theory is what ends up leading into uh, module theory yeah and then that is what takes you into character theory what i do mm-hmm. um so can you tell me a little bit about the research that you do? The like, the, Do you look at a specific project within character theory, or how, so, does, how does it work? So I did, um, so I, when I first started grad school, I really liked, well, I really liked Galois theory, because I felt like it was, you know, I really liked the story of Evariste Galois, and yeah. I, I just, I really liked it. Once I got into grad school, I really liked the idea of character theory because it was kind of like this this like mythical thing that was out there that I didn't know a lot about, <laughs> yeah. and I really wanted to. Um, and as I learned more about it, I really liked it. So, um, so uh, a couple of a couple of decades ago, my advisor proved a problem, um, show, uh, essentially saying that if uh, if you have an irreducible character of some order. In, in some group, or an irreducible character of some degree in some group, mm-hmm. then uh, the the order of that group is bounded by this certain number. And he asked, he's like, well, when do groups of this certain number, or something like that, um, have an irreducible character of this degree? And um, I ended up talking in, in the algebra seminar about a paper. That paper, at the end of it, kind of answered a particular case of that question Mm -hmm. but and there was another person before them who answered kind of the the previous case of that question and I I was talking to my advisor and um, I ended up saying I'm like what if we didn't because they use a lot of like uh, computer algebra systems to solve it um, like uh, gap and magma okay Um, which there's limits to and you can't do it when the order of the group gets absolutely massive. So I said, what if there's a way of doing this by letting uh, some of this stuff just be arbitrary and just playing group theoretic games? And we started working on it and I started looking at some examples and I, I, I saw this pattern forming and I went to him, I ended up propo- like coming up with a, a theorem and I went to him, and I wrote it on his board, and he looked at it and said, no, that's not true. <laughs> and I'm like, but I, it looks like it's true from the few, ex- <laughs> from the few examples. Yeah. So we started, we started working on some small cases of it, and, it, and I, so I started proving it in cases, and it was, it was proving true. It was, we were able to prove it. Um, and we kind of kept going and kept going. And every time we would take it another step further, we may have to adjust something. But the idea there, that the, the core idea that I was having, and it's a way of taking Frobenius groups and tying them into character degrees, um, that core idea there kept holding. And over the past year, we've been able to prove it almost in complete generality under a particular assumption. So 
you know, we're looking at groups of order d times d plus e, where e is just some integer bigger than one and d is some integer. Um, and we've been able to prove it in almost complete generality when d and d plus e are co-prime. Okay. Now, the idea that I'm having, that I'm working on right now when d and d plus e are co-prime, breaks immediately when d and d plus e aren't co-prime. So if they share a prime, then it breaks immediately. Mm -hmm. um, but I was quite happy that in the beginning of my research, I was able to construct a theorem that has turned out um, to kind of gain some legs and get some results. So um, it's been a fun, it's been fun. To, to how long, uh, how much research do you try and, when you do research, mm -hmm. let me ask a, the question in a smart way, and then we should probably wrap up. <laughs> oh, yeah. But um, how do you, do you struggle to find time to do research? How does doing research, what does that look like for you? You, you can't struggle to find time. You just have to find time. You make time. There, yeah, there's no, no if, ands, or buts about it. If you just had like a 12-hour day doing something, you still have to do research. Do you do it every day? Every day. How many, how many hours a day do you do? I, it, I try to do at least four. Now, out of those four hours, I would say one or two of those hours is me learning stuff that I should already know. <laughs> yeah. So that I, just because you start... I felt that. <laughs> right. Just because you start research does not mean that you are an expert in everything that you should know. <laughs> no. So um, usually about half the time is me learning stuff that I should already know. And then the other half of the time is me trying to either wrap my head around concepts or actually trying to, to do something. So like a couple of weeks ago, I presented something to my advisor and I got to a point and he's like, oh, those are Zygmundi primes. And, and you're I'm, like, what is a Zygmundi prime? What is a Zygmundi prime? So Sounds made up if you ask me. <laughs> so this he's like, two, yeah, three, no, so, five, maybe. <laughs> so this past week, I start just trying to look up, and I'm just trying to learn about Zygmundi primes. I end up finding an old paper of his, ends up citing Zygmundi primes, one of his graduate students cited them, um, and then actually Zygmundi's theorem. And I took that stuff, and where I was getting stuck on my current research thing, I was actually, I was able to prove and, and get past it, um, which is, abnormal because it, you're 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 doing research and you have like complete success in what you're seeking out to do over that week yeah uh, that does not happen <laughs> um i know that i when i was doing my master's and i was doing a project it's a thesis um I, when i was doing research i felt that when you're when you're looking at the problem and you're trying to understand it you never really get away from it. This is kind of a, this was a quote from my thesis advisor. He goes, when you're, when you're taken with the problem, you won't struggle to find time or make time with it because it will always be with you. Right. And I did kind of feel that, especially towards the end when we were writing the paper. Like in the beginning, it was kind of dragging, I was kind of dragging my feet. But towards the end, it was like you couldn't help but think about the but problem. But think about it, yeah. Yeah, because it's kind of like, it's kind of like anything. I mean, if you go to the gym like a couple times, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm here, I'm lifting weights. But if you're not into it, eventually you stop. Right. But if you, you know, really get into like the gym culture or the gym, I, I pick gym because I've been going to the gym right. this past month or so. Um, you won't struggle to find time to get there if you actually really like it. It's like the problem that me and my advisor are working on. I don't really, like I'm thinking of, it's, it's back there. I don't have to really... Now, eventually, you do have to sit down and you know try something. Write some details. Write yeah. some details, but as long, but I don't think that any of these guys in the department just kind of haphazardly stumble upon no. some kind of idea. It's just no. they're doing their day to day routine, right? And then in the back of their mind, their research is there, right? And anybody who's who's learning math, who's just starting to kind of get into it, or uh, maybe they're maybe they're like just starting grad school, maybe they're even in in grad school or an undergrad or whatever. And they're they're having fun taking classes and learning stuff. If you're having fun doing that, wait until you start doing research <laughs> on something that you actually enjoy. You have to love it too. It, yeah, and it it becomes it actually becomes fun. So yeah. for for me, somebody who struggled with qualifying exams for two years, I'm finally at the point where 
I, I like can't wait to do research. I get excited just to do research, whether, I, and now I'm gonna struggle the whole time because research is not something that you just start and make constant progress. linear progress yeah. the entire time. But that struggle becomes uh, fun. It feels, it feels like you're, you're just, like you're exercising your brain in the right way. You're not doing something beneath you. You're not doing something above you. You're just doing something. You're you're like right where you need to be. It yeah. it just feels right. So let me ask you this: You chose algebra because you just enjoyed the subject more, as opposed to the other classes. Um, algebra. I imagine after the qualifier experience, you'd be like, <laughs> Let, "Take this analysis and put it away from me." Algebra started. Um, I really got into. Well, the people who taught my algebra class, I really liked, um, and I liked the way that they delivered material. Sometimes but, it's just, you know, it feels right when you right. do it. But I, first, first I was always curious about some, some topics. I was always curious about Galois theory. I was always curious about character theory. So that kind of led to me kind of uh, um, persuading my brain to like algebra more. Um, How come you didn't but, mess with any of the applied math courses? It just, it was never something that intrigued me. Now I'm, now I'm not saying that I wouldn't be intrigued if I got into it, but I just... I always wanted just to learn math for the sake of math. That's, I think, the commonality between all the pure math people. Yeah. That they just do it for the sport. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times people will ask me, like, well, what's character theory used for? I don't care. <laughs> yeah. If, it's it's not the job. It's like if, if Milwaukee goes out and makes a tool. Now, sure, that tool has a function. But that tool is going to be used for a lot of different projects, and they may not be aware of a lot of the projects that it's being used for. Um, and that's kind of what, what pure math is. You're, you're taking this toolbox, you're throwing a bunch of tools in it. Some of those tools are gonna to be used a lot. Yeah. Some of those tools are never gonna be pulled out of the toolbox. Probably most of them. <laughs> but if, if there aren't people who further the topic, then when, when tools need to be used, maybe those tools don't exist. So okay. the, I always describe it as like pure mathematicians fill the toolbox, applied mathematicians pull tools out of the toolbox and use them. Now sure, applied mathematicians also have to, you know, develop math and that sort of thing. But but pure mathematicians uh, really further the, uh, really further the knowledge yeah. of, and how it's, how it's used and how it's applied I'll leave that to the applied mathematicians. I appreciate applied math more. I wish yeah. I I like I loved probability theory, and I want to do more with statistics because I feel like those two are like peanut butter and jelly. Yeah, they go together. So that's kind of the one of my goals in the future is to to do more statistics. Do you have any life goals not related to math that uh, you want to get accomplished in the next decade? <sighs> we'll do this and then ask the final question because this is going on an hour. Oh. <laughs> Life, no, I'm, I'm glad it's, it's, it, we got a lot of details. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life, life goals, man, it is, it is tough. It, I, it gets uh, really fast when you get older. <laughs> yeah, it does. I guess I, I want to get to a point, and now I, I am at, at this point in my life, but I want to get to a point where I am, am comfortable in my own mind. Like, I'm, I'm comfortable and confident in my own head. I, I went so long doubting myself. And questioning whether or not I was good enough, whether it's professional or personal or anything like that. And I'd really love to get to the point to where, no, regardless of what happens after this or anything like that, I just want to get to the point in my head where I feel like I am good enough professionally and personally. Yeah. That's that's really the the goal that I'd like to get to. You know? That's a good goal to have. And, it's not superficial, like right. And I've I've made it for in my education. I've made it further than I ever thought that I would. Oh yeah. Um, and I never I never got into this because I wanted to, uh, you know, go find a job to make X number of dollars and work at this company or anything like that. I got into this because I was told that I couldn't do it, <laughs> and I you just wanted to prove the haters wrong. <laughs> well. Well, it, it wasn't just like some random person. You know, I, I wanted to do this because I, I wanted to show myself that I could actually do it. Yeah. And getting to that point now, it makes me it makes me happy. It doesn't make me, you know, uh, like wish ill on people or anything like that. Yeah, of course. It, it just makes me, it makes me happy with knowing that, you know, somebody doubted me and I was able to, to actually do that thing. And that's... 
you know, whether that's a selfish reason or not. I uh, think everyone kind of has a little bit of that. Or, I don't know about everyone, but I do think that there, you run into people all throughout your life that tell you that you're not good enough for this or you should stay away from this. At least at some point in time, right. you'll come across that. And some people are like, will respond to it differently. They're like, eh, you're probably right. Or if you don't really get... But if it's something that you really, 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 really care about, right. then, you know, this is this is what happens. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you yeah. put you put in the time and effort, you can do it. Right, yeah. And and that's the thing. Any, I am... A lot of athletes have well, that same yeah, story. Like what we talked about, I am not a naturally gifted mathematician like a lot of the folks that I know. Um, but if you put time and effort into it, you will surpass where you think you are in your own okay so that's uh, yeah that's how do you decompress what do you do for fun <laughs> um <laughs> he shivered <laughs> <laughs> so on on the weekends or things like that i uh i i play i play video games with a, a couple of folks that i've played with for over a decade um and uh i i really enjoy doing that i'm you know, my, my, my girlfriend's a, a nice way of uh, kind of, you know, because she's, she's not in the math background or the science background or anything like that. So uh, the thing that I do every day, she, she doesn't know that it exists. And sometimes, you know, it, you kind of struggle with it. Sometimes you wish they did. Other times, it's really nice that they don't because it allows you to kind of escape that world for a little bit yeah, of time. Yeah, you need a release. Yeah. You can't just do it 24-7. You can't just stay in it. Unless you're one of my instructors, then he just permanently <laughs> lives there. So it's, uh, that that's really, uh, being able to sometimes kind of escape that and, and spend some time with her is nice. Yeah. Um, and video games are nice. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've gotten, I think I've gotten to the point in my life where I'm able to not obsess over this thing like obsess over math enough to where it just it takes my quality of life and diminishes it I can obsess over it but when I do it increases my quality of life because I enjoy what I'm doing I'm not just doing it for some uh, unknown reason that it just makes me miserable I'm not right. miserable when I do math which yeah. is good yeah I'm miserable when I do my homework sometimes and I can't get it done. I was like, this needs to be done tonight. I need this done tonight now. Wow. <laughs> then, that, then that'll make me miserable. But mo other than that, it, I'm, I'm pretty good. Once you get past candidacy, though, you'll never have to think about it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No more homework. Okay, so this is the last question. I'm asking everyone this question because we're math people. What is your favorite number and why? I, I, I'm, really, I, I'm probably going to be the only one with this answer. I don't have a favorite number. I don't believe that. <laughs> I pro I don't have I'm I don't have a favorite anything. No my, favorite, no color, no movie, nothing. no video my, game. My girlfriend just asked me my favorite movie I don't know, 3 or 4 days ago. I do not have a favorite. I have things that I like, but I I've never understood the idea of favorite. Now maybe maybe that's something in my brain that's not connecting appropriately. Um, but I do not have a favorite I just don't have a favorite number. All right. So, what was the first number that came to mind when I asked the question? Zero. <laughs> You're a jerk. I, I, yeah, zero came. As soon as you said number, I, I nothing. Thought of so the zero. zero. Yeah, I thought of the number zero. I'll tell you this. Uh, I know a woman. I won't say her name. I asked her what her favorite number was. She's very religious. Yeah. So when I asked her, she said one. And I'm like, how come? She goes, because there is one God. And mm. she, you know, gave a religious answer. Yeah. And then I was, she's my friend, so I asked her, like, so does that mean that atheist's favorite number is zero? <laughs> <laughs> and she just laughed, and then we kind of moved on from there. But that was just, that's what came to mind. Yeah, I am, <laughs> I I am zero. not, I am not religious, and I would not come up with the number one because of that. But I can respect somebody doing that. I, yeah. I just, I've just never had a favorite anything, let alone a number. So, oh, all right. Yeah. To each his own, I suppose. Anyway, yeah. so we talked about a lot. I'm very thankful that uh, you agreed to do this. Some people are a bit skittish because it's the internet, but yeah. math people, I think, are generally speaking, a good good group of people to talk to. You know the so, and it also helps shed some light on you know what we go through on a daily basis because everyone kind of handles the workload differently, and it's good to get those perspectives. Right. Do you have any questions for me before we leave? 
Uh, no, I, I will say to any to anybody listening to this who's a math major, whether you're in undergrad or graduate school, and you have questions about either you know the the life of a mathematician or what does research look like, you know maybe you're like me and you were a little intimidated to ask your professors who are who are doing it. Don't be. Ask them. Just talk to them. It just makes. One, it'll probably make their day because a lot of people just aren't interested in math. So it's nice to see people who are interested in math. And two, they'll probably open up and answer your question a lot more detailed than what you would imagine that they would. So, yeah. Very good. I think that's generally true for any graduate student, too, that if you're going, you have to be comfortable talking to the instructor and asking questions because it makes... A lot of the guesswork, you have to get rid of all that guesswork and find out explicitly what it is that they're looking for and what's expected of them. Right. And that's true. That's not even true for school. Well, I mean, it is true for school. What I'm saying is that's true for in life <laughs> in general. I just discovered when I moved up here. It's like you yeah. got to beat down doors. Yeah. Make your own. Anyway, so that was a good interview. Yeah.